So learning curves, I'm sure you've seen some of these before, mostly on Reddit and other fun sites. They're trying to show you how complicated uh, programming languages are and how hard they are to learn. And down there, you'll have something easy, right? Uh, mainstream languages, and then you have something that's a bit more difficult in the middle. And then you see the C++ graph, and it looks like some, something like this, right? <laughs> But that's actually good, because what do these axes mean? Time, skill. So what does that mean? We actually have a, rap a phase of rapid skill acquisition <laughs> to the point where we can build a time machine. As we go backwards in time, we become a time lord, reach the top, and become one with the universe. <laughs> well, not really. I mean, it probably looks something like this which still defeats the purpose of what the person tried to do here, right? Because it still means a huge amount of skill learned in a very short amount of time, which means C++ is the easiest language of all of them. So, yeah. <laughs> because an actual learning curve is probably more like this, right? You have slow start, you're getting introduced to all the new things, you don't have any intuition yet. Eventually you get there and then you have this rapid rise in skill, right? You're getting fast and productive, and then you eventually you plateau as you become more experienced, you become this expert, right? And there's only few things that really are left to master. Is what I would say if this wasn't C++, because this is only your first 10 years. <laughs> so, so, of course, um, at this point, you've probably had to deal with the most vexing parts. Somewhere in your legacy code base, you found this monstrosity, which declares something, I don't know what, but this may be related to the array decay, probably. Speaking of containers, have you ever tried initializing a vector of integers with two elements? Yeah, me neither. Now that you're using containers, you already know about algorithms, and those usually involve lambdas. You need to know about lambda captures, which is like an entire universe of edge cases. And value categories, because oh, L value and R value is too easy. <laughs> so we need like an entire graph. I think it's the only graph in the standard that lists the value categories. <laughs> well, of course, that involves moving and a move from state, which, oh, that's a thing now. Okay, cool. Um, so you step away from all of that and look, hey, what is in the new stuff? Hey, coroutines, oh, those are cool. I mean, you see all the examples and it's amazing, but have you tried implementing them? <laughs> like, the stuff you need to know about object lifetimes just to get that correct. And I think that object lifetimes are the biggest source of undefined behavior in the entire language. And of course, as you're trying to find information on this, you eventually find the launder, and nobody on this planet can explain to you what it does or why you need it. And if you ask the people who put it in the standard, they tell you not to use it. <laughs> so did you also know that there isn't just undefined behavior, there's also unspecified behavior, which is different and it's associated with order of evaluation. That's cool. Well, keep going. At this time point, you're about 150 years into your career, and you've been doing template metaprogramming the entire time. So of course, you know that substitution failure is not an error, and um, you realize that someone put this in the standard, and you're supposed to know what that is. Um, well, but hey, we have concepts now and they make everything easier, which means everything you know about Sphene is now irrelevant. <laughs> Great. Anyway, going on, concepts, of course, have a major impact on overload resolution. So now you have to know everything about overload resolution, which means two-phase lookup, some assumption, argument-dependent lookup, which is so amazing that people invented something to disable it. <laughs> and oh my god, at some point you're gonna to try to implement pack indexing. And then, some random asshole from across the planet is gonna exploit your signed integer overflow, get root access to your customer's network, and you're just, I mean, this is it, right? This is, it's starting to dawn on you that maybe, maybe, you just rewrite it in Rust. Oh. <laughs>